This is it. We made it. When people think of Hunter x Hunter, they think of this. The palace, the king, the chairman, the monster. When you ask someone what their favorite episode is, what their favorite fight is, who their favorite character is, etc. on to infinity, they will almost certainly cite the last part of the Chimera Ant arc. This ending is one that has gone down in anime history, and has become legend. Now, I love Hunter x Hunter, and I always will, but I've never been one who can see it as a perfect masterpiece. Its flaws are numerous, and in several cases, quite severe. I've spent a fair amount of my time on this channel highlighting just that. The last time I touched this series, it was almost scathing. Maybe I'm too negative on occasions even, but all that means is that you can trust my word when I say the legends are true. I have no choice but to be picked up by the hype train. After all the ways that the last section disappointed me, after all the ways that it kicked me in the gut and spit in my face, after grazing the threshold of my patience, nearly causing me to quit forever, Togashi grabbed me by the throat and threw me back into my chair, ensuring that I never actually make anything useful out of my life. The end of this arc is what inspired me to restart my YouTube channel. It's euphoria. It's enlightenment. No. It is light itself. A flawless paradigm that retroactively paves over all of its own past sins to create pure perfection. And it is perfect. <coughs> God, I hate being that pretentious, even as a joke. Oh, fuck me. All right, let's take a big step back. I've already spoiled how fantastic I think the rest of the Chimera Ant arc is, and I really want to spend most of this video singing its praises, but I can't. Not yet. Because there are some things wrong with the climax, and I'd feel like a DC fanboy screaming about the genius of Batman v Superman if I didn't bring them up. Or a Marvel fanboy screaming about something. I don't know, I don't fucking care. You're both a bunch of freaks nowadays. In summary, I'm gonna talk about the bad stuff first before we spend God knows how long fellatiating Togashi. By the way, I've got good news and bad news. Good news or bad news, actually. It's all about... Perspective. I know we had so much fun last time, but after receiving plenty of feedback... Also, IDK, what to tell you, dude, but this video is just not funny like it's annoyingly unfunny. What you are trying is theoretically funny, but you overcommit to it so much it's just not funny anymore. I have decided that we will no longer be doing jokes. We just don't have room for them in the budget, so we'll be talking about serious stuff instead. Grown-up stuff. Seriously, though, this video is going to be significantly more normal than the last one. And if you're lucky, maybe a bit more normal as well? Maybe. I don't know. Who could say? Anyway, roll the thing. As discussed a minute ago, the pacing is anything but perfect. It's actually still pretty bad. I hope you're ready to see this staircase for the next seven episodes, by the way. <laughs> this section has 56 chapters, or 25 episodes, depending on which version you go with, to fill with intrigue, which doesn't seem so bad, right? I mean, York knew it was only one chapter shorter, and it's a certified masterpiece. If Tokashi could do it then, he can do it now. A nice thought, but he's working under a much different set of circumstances now than he was then. York New had 55 chapters for its entire plot, to introduce new characters, settings, and conflicts in the first act, develop them, create twists, misdirects, and all that, etc. in the second act, and finally to reach a satisfying conclusion in the third. All the components of a compelling story. The Ant Climax has the same amount of space, but only that last little step to fill it with. Now, this is complicated stuff, so if we've got any math experts listening, tell me if you see a problem here. We've got a numbers issue. The climax is typically the shortest part of a story, which is a standard that shonen series have been pushing to its limits for decades now, but even so, being at the highest point of intensity for this long is it's just fucking exhausting. So far I've framed the situation as Togashi having a certain amount of chapters to fill, but he could have just written less, right? Is that an editor issue? So everything about traditional storytelling logic suggests that this can't work, but there's nothing quite like human ingenuity. 
We've seen a lot of Shonen Climaxes adopt this 60-ish chapter big battle format quite successfully recently. See Shibuya or Infinity Castle, neither of which would likely exist without those authors reading this arc. The Chimera Ants have been a consistent inspiration for authors to come, and I would guess that's because they could see what was holding it back from true greatness. Shibuya works because Akutami took the sluggish pace of Hunter x Hunter and fed it a diet of pure Adderall. The outside appearance of the building is preserved, but the once sprawling wide open floors have been transformed into a million cubicles and offices, allowing for the feeling of consistent progress as well as much greater variety. If the metaphor is confusing, the basic idea is that Shibuya's fights are much more plentiful, occur quicker, and are more diverse in dynamics. Maybe I'm getting distracted ranting about JJK, but the reason is because it does everything right that Hunter x Hunter does wrong here. There's not that many fights occurring through the climax, and most of them go on for millennia, some to the point where you're just waiting for the sweet embrace of the end. It's not even that long of a staircase, man. <laughs> I've been hyperfixating on the pacing for a while now, as I often do, but try to keep in mind that this is still a positive review. Most of the resolutions are stretched out to just shy of their tearing threshold, so you never quite break into a fit of insanity while reading, and the good parts are more than enough to compensate. Before we can get to those goods, though, we have to cover the only other major complaint I have, that being, why can't the narrator just shut the fuck up? So this is more of a complaint for the anime than anything else, by the way. Yes, narration is still present in the manga, and it definitely is a bit much, but at least you get to read it at your own pace. And that pace is guaranteed to be faster than the anime's narrator, as long as you pass the third grade. Despite my vitriol towards it here, narration is not an inherently bad technique for telling a story. It does have a tendency to shift the show versus tell balance due to its purely expository nature, but a healthy dose of creativity and or purpose can make it the greatest decision a writer ever makes. And I'm not even going to try to explain how Mr. Robot uses its narrator. The value that would be added to this video is frankly not worth spoiling it for you, so just go watch it on your own. And if you don't... Fuck you. Hunter x Hunter has always had narration, and yeah, it's never gotten even remotely close to justifying its existence, but it's historically been tolerable at worst. I mean, the principal yells at you over the loudspeaker for like, what, 20 seconds at the end of every episode? And then you've already forgotten he was ever there by the third bar of the outro song. You know, whatever. But Togashi and Madhouse, uh, they can't be forgettable. Oh no, no, we will be remembered, and if it won't be for heroism, then it's gotta be for villainy. I swear to god, I'm at least 90% sure that they made a bet that they couldn't have the narrator say every word in the English language within 25 episodes. And yeah, they couldn't. But that sure didn't stop them from trying. At points, it seems like he talks over every single scene in a premeditated manner specifically designed to prevent you from being immersed in the world. It's like going on a date at Olive Garden, except the waiter won't stop yelling the specials at you from across the room with a megaphone. I have eyes, and you have the capability for visual storytelling. Let's both use our special talents. Please, I'm fucking begging you. Cool your shape of the fall of Okay, wow, uh, 1,500 words into the script of this overwhelmingly positive review, and we can finally talk about the things I like. Uh, am I? Am I just like a negative person or something? Do I need help? <laughs> yeah, boy. When I was talking about series that have been influenced by and improved on the Chimera Ant arc, I highlighted their presentation of the original structure. You may not have realized that that was a setup, what with your feeble, soft mind and all. But it was. Togashi's framework is impeccable. Once it gets moving, the section quickly breaks down into a series of individual fights and confrontations as the members of the extermination team attempt to keep the Royal Guard away from the king. This type of split-up is very common within shonen series, especially during war arcs or conflicts with large amounts of characters. Boiling the battle down to one-on-ones gives the audience a more intimate view of the interaction between two participants' fighting styles, but more importantly, it eliminates the need to draw or animate large amounts of characters at one time. It's as much a production shortcut as it is a stylistic choice. Maybe even more so, and it really limits the ability of an author to capture the true scale of a large battle. There's a reason Naruto's war arc only feels like a war for one episode, and it's money. Also time, but time is money. You've seen In Time. What the fuck? More often than not, it feels like how Shakespeare would write big battles. Have two guys fight on stage while the chorus piss shits and comes his pants begging you to pretend there's an army there. This is functional in theater due to the inherent suspension of disbelief required for the medium, but it's really immersion breaking in a TV show. We're losing him! We're losing him! He's dying! Yet, there are some cheat codes to make war work on a budget. So let's talk about interchangeability. In the entertainment district arc of Demon Slayer, the main characters are split up into two fights against two main antagonists. Despite being separate in nature, they occur in close proximity to each other within the same setting, meaning that they can and do interact. Characters change opponents, attacks get interrupted by spillover from other attacks, motherfuckers get thrown from one fight to another like a jackass crew member, it's awesome. And this is what I mean by interchangeability. A term of my own creation, and defined as when characters are free to mix and match between distinct yet closely related encounters. 
Thinking back to our previous example, how boring would that arc be if Tanjiro and the gang fought Daki and won, then fought Gyodoro and won? There'd be no element of dynamism or unpredictability. Equating each fight to a musical instrument, you'd play the guitar line, then the drums, then the bass, so on and so forth. Sure, they sound fine on their own, but weaving them together at the same time, over and through each other, turns it into a symphony of violence. Shifting your pieces around the board even just a little bit helps recreate the intended sense of scale and brings about huge levels of suspense. You can never be 100% sure which pieces will end up where or what effect they'll have on the others until you reach the end, which is how you get me reading entire arcs in a single day. I may have a problem. Hunter x Hunter doesn't have quite the same explosive energy as Demon Slayer's attempt at interchangeability thanks to its sluggish pace, but the technique is still masterfully applied to create a satisfying climax. Every single cast member, whether pro or antagonist, has their own unique path through the setting and its encounters. As an example, I'll highlight Kilawa. He starts out of the staircase with everyone else in the fight against Yupi, then moves on to the King's Chamber with Gon where he'll face Pito, but not before passing by Netero and Zeno while they escort Meroem. After that, he goes to the courtyard to face Yupi again, this time with Knuckle and Shoot, then he moves into the hallways and fights Palm, before finally following Gon back to the extermination team's base. There's more steps I didn't mention, but you know, you get the idea. Instead of being stuck to one plot point, he gets to shift around naturally in whatever direction current events are dragging him, refreshing the dynamic of whatever pre-existing situation he finds himself in. And that's just one thread out of over 15, all weaving in and out of each other to form a beautiful tapestry. I stand by my earlier opinion that some of the fights go on for way too long, but there's no doubt that interchangeability prevents them from being unbearable, with how the status quo can and does shift on a dime. We'll move on to something else soon, but I'm not quite done gushing about narrative structure, which is my secret crack. The final cog in this wibbly-wobbly machine that really glues it all together is horses. I mean, spatial awareness glue joke? The basis of interchangeability. Even a small understanding of how the positions of characters relate to each other creates a visceral immersive thrill, as if the story is inhabiting a real place and not just a series of backgrounds. When combined with interchangeability, the story can produce tension simply by having a character exist in a space. The knowledge of what spaces are adjacent to said space and what is going on in them then forces the audience to wonder if the proverbial main character will collide with those neighboring occurrences or not, creating a self-sufficient suspense generator. The Chimera Ant Climax, I'm kind of starting to hate the word climax, let's try a few synonyms. The Chimera Ant Apotheosis is one such machine. The King's Palace is a very impressively constructed setting. We spend a large portion of the second act viewing it from every possible angle, creating a thorough mental map of the connections between gates, doorways, halls, staircases, and so on well before the zenith can even begin. What's more impressive is how subtly this is done. You never feel like you're being lectured on a virtual real estate tour. Instead, environmental education is woven into the background, being passively absorbed by the viewer while they focus on the characterization and plot at the forefront. Characterization, that's a good segue. Almost all of Togashi's best character writing is compressed into this narrative peak, to the point where I won't be talking about basically anything else for the rest of the video. If you remember the last episode of the series, you'll hopefully recall that I kinda ragged on the character writing of this arc. Not quite Charlie Kirk takes on leftist kid who still has a lot to learn aggressive, by the way YouTube, I would say stop recommending me this shit, but it is too fucking funny. Honestly keep showing me this thumbnail, I love it so much. But I certainly wasn't nice, so you can imagine my absolute shock at how completely Togashi manages to turn things around. Comparing the start to the end, if I disliked a character, I came to appreciate them. If I liked a character, I loved them. And if I loved a character, I became obsessed with them. This is the first and only time I will ever care about Shoot. I remember who Welfin is. Zeno Zoldic, who's he's just randomly fucking here, he gets super compelling character development. Why? How? I mean, what wizard wrote this? I like Palm now. Even she decides to go the way of the Texas DA and escape from the Chris Hansen shenanigans by fucking dying. Only to come back as bugs and shit. Am I crying? It's downright bizarre how much more compelling the characters and the plot are here than they were just a couple of chapters ago. A good deal of that deficit is inexplicable with anything other than eldritch magic, but the most significant non-ethereal driver of this change is the stakes. It's pretty much writing 101 that stakes are crucial for getting an audience invested in any story. Your characters have to want something, you have to want them to get that something, and there has to be at least the impression that they might not get it. Some sense of danger, to put it simply. Which brings us to a problem. The rest of the arc doesn't have any. Act 1 gets a pass since the whole purpose is to create complacency through that absence, and then terror upon its sudden reinjection. But Malcolm in the middle drops it off a cliff like it's his baby. All my Spartans and ice apparitions put those hands up! Then the apex starts and the problem goes to heaven. Watching the apogee of the ants, for the first time ever it feels like your favorite character might die. Almost everyone is facing down foes magnitudes more dangerous than those shown before, and there's a lot more on the line than just their individual lives. 
Even if Knuckle merely gets incapacitated, that still means Yuppie is free to beeline it to Marowim and put Grandpa to bed, which would ruin the plans we've spent hours upon hours watching this team put together. Just the idea that all of that effort and all of that time we spent might go to waste makes it instantly more compelling. The best character writing, however, and where the stakes are the highest, is within the paths of Gon, Kilua, Netero, Komagi, and Marowim. Warning, this is... It, it's gonna take a while. The Chimera Antarch is not quite the end of Gon, but it is the culmination of his journey, as well as the last of his days as the protagonist of Hunter x Hunter, and Togashi certainly set up an appropriate bang to get him out the door. No moment in the series has as much build-up as Gon and Kilo's rematch with Neferpito, the greatest antagonist that either of them ever have or ever will face. The last time the three of them met was when they were brought to the lowest point in their arcs. They were beaten and defeated, too weak to even witness Kite's battle, much less a sister save him. A clear setup, only made clearer by the intervening training. Fall short, temper yourself, and grasp victory at last. In this moment, typical narrative logic would dictate only good things for our protagonists. They fell short, they tempered, and now it's their turn to grasp. Where there was once defeat, now there should be victory. Where once they stood beneath the monster, now they should stand above it, dominant and in control. Traditional narrative logic holds true. The two boys tower over Neferpito, and Gon holds power where once he held nothing but failure. And it is terrifying. Anyone who has ever been even tangentially familiar with Hunter x Hunter knows what Gon is supposed to be like. This is how he looks, and he acts pretty much as he appears. So when you see this, it feels wrong. There's a massive disparity between these two states of being, and not knowing the context leaves you to assume there isn't any way to bridge that gap without pulling it straight out of your ass. But there's the thing. This makes perfect sense. Nothing has ever made this much sense in the history of the world. It's one of those perfect plot twists that no one would ever see coming, but you really should have. Gon was destined to break at some point, but why? Why here and why now? All good questions that I don't think most people have the answers to. Here's my personal interpretation as well as why I think this is one of the best character moments I've ever experienced. Gon is the epitome of Hunter x Hunter, epitome. specifically in its status as a genre deconstruction. Just like how you can enjoy the series normally, but will get much more out of it if you're familiar with the conventions of its predecessors, Gon truly shines in the context of other shonen heroes. If you were to boil him down to the broadest of strokes, you'd find little more than the most basic of protagonist templates. A go-getting, once-in-a-lifetime talent with an uncanny ability for drawing friends and allies to their side who wants nothing more than to get stronger. He's your standard Goku, Naruto, Luffy type, and that's a fine archetype. I probably wouldn't be this into Shonen if I didn't have some fondness for it, but you can't deny that they're pretty homogenous in their desire. It's always power. In a world that runs off of trading fists instead of words, strength is the essential currency you need to participate in the narrative economy, so it makes sense from a writer's perspective to motivate your characters with physical improvement. Most of these series also have a strong fondness for classic ideals of masculinity, leading to a worldview largely in support of the quests they portray. I happen to also have a soft spot for that kind of thing. Say what you will about where that fondness comes from, but it's there. Especially when it's in Yu Yu Hakusho, which... Hey, wait a minute, Togashi, that's you! Well, that's a convenient comparison. Team Yurameshi is probably the premier example of what I'm talking about anyway, so don't accuse me of reaching here. If Yu Yu Hakusho is one of the classics of classic shonen, then Hunter x Hunter is a response, and Gon a counter-argument to Yusuke. Beyond the first couple of storylines, Yusuke's character arc always revolves around pushing his abilities to new heights. He has to get stronger to defeat Rando, stronger to protect the ordinary world from the Saint Beasts, stronger to save Yukina from slavers, stronger to protect all of his friends from the Toguro, strong enough to save everyone from Sensui, and stronger still to stop a three-world war. You can measure his growth as a person by the size of his spirit gun, and that is not a euphemism, I promise. And it's satisfying because he's always doing it for the right reason. That classically masculine concept of being a protector and defending the people you love. Of course, fiction is fiction, so think about reality now. I know, terrifying, but please. Are the people grasping for power in our world as virtuous as that? I'm sure they'd like you to think so, but no, they're not. Amongst the presidents, politicians, and CEOs, self-interest reigns supreme, whether it's pure avarice, hubris, a hole of insecurity in your heart that you just can't fill, or some combination of all three. It's all about them and no one else. 
That's a penis! These faces probably aren't what come to mind when you think about real-life training arcs, but power, strength, whatever you want to call it, is really just an aspect of the bigger concept that these guys are really all about. Control. The ability to mold the world as you see fit, whether that be through military might, political influence, money, or anything else you might have. Even though one is required for the other, these two concepts are not the same. First, strength can exist without control, but the other way around is impossible. Second, strength is usually a positive term, whereas control takes on a negative connotation. And I'd argue both of these reasons are because control is a corruption of strength. It is the result of growing in power for the wrong reason. Strength is built to weather the storm, but control is created in an attempt to halt it, preventing the rightful operation of nature. So if Yu Yu Hakusho and All Shonen by Proxy are about strength, Hunter x Hunter is about control. It would technically be accurate to call Jing's abandonment of his son the beginning of the story, but foundation is a better term. That choice is more than a mere event in the timeline that just so happened to occur first. It's a route split, and the narrative builds up from that base decision in the direction it's set, making every subsequent plot point a logical derivative of the first. I realize I'm kind of just explaining how storytelling works, but... The early experience of a willingly absentee father is the foundation Gon is working from, and it was undeniably a traumatic event for him. Maybe you think it's a stretch to call it trauma when he was literally too young to remember it happening, and the constant ear-to-ear -ear smiling probably doesn't help my point, but the base drive for his actions makes it pretty irrefutable. Childhood trauma is often the lack of something necessary for a kid to develop in a healthy manner, and a common response to the hole left behind is to fill it with replacements. This is what Gon spends the entire series doing up until he enters the NGL. And now I'm going to make things even more complicated by subdividing that emptiness into two parts. The physical and the conceptual, both of which coalesce during his fight with Pito. Sorry. On a physical level, Gon is missing a father figure in his life. Welcome back, Captain Obvious. Yes, I am! All those words are spelled correctly! I know this ain't exactly a brain-busting revelation or anything, but stick with me. The way this affects him is far more interesting. Your relationship with your parents is the primary contributor towards developing an attachment style, or the way you build relationships with others, to put it in English adjacent. Modern theory contains four different types, of which we can immediately throw out the only good one. Uh, why? I mean, look at him. Secure attachment my ass, if he was a superhero his codename would be Red Flag. That leaves the insecure styles, and anxious attachment seems to be the best fit for Gon. This one is often the result of parents who are absent or neglectful. Darman! Bingo! Ah! And although there are many ways it can manifest, clinginess seems to be numero uno. By the way, keep in mind, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff, so don't take my word as gospel or science. I just Google shit. The neglect of a parent, who a child recognizes as someone who should be taking care of them, imprints the fear that anyone else in a similar position may also leave them, leading to an even tighter grip. With this knowledge, it should be readily apparent why Gon is stickier than a... 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 glue stick! Glue stick! Most of his major relationships are defined by an almost compulsive dedication, even and especially when it isn't really appropriate. It doesn't show on the surface, but he's terrified that people will leave him just like his father, and his relationship with Kite only makes sense under that context. Besides maybe Leorio, who nobody cares about, Kite is probably the one wholly positive relationship Gon has with another male character. He's friendly, caring, supportive without being a helicopter, and has Gon's best interests in mind whenever they're together. Of course, what Kite thinks is best for Gon may not be entirely accurate. I mean, kind of like giving your infant to your 22-year-old frat boy cousin for the weekend. I mean, I'm sure he cares, but like, what the hell is he supposed to do? Play beer pong with the kid? He'll probably roofie the little guy to get him to sleep. Why is it purple? <laughs> Why is it fizzing? <laughs> like in a monster movie, uh, just drink it, it's famous people water. Surrogate parenthood is clearly not in Kite's skill set, but it's undeniable that he's at least trying. This goes part of the way to explain why Gon feels so close to this man he barely knew. But another side of the deal is that Kite had the perfect set of traits to fill the void in Gon's life. Not only was he an older male figure, but he was also Jing's literal student, making it super easy to slip into his place in Gon's mind. No matter how brief their relationship was, it gave Gon a taste of what it was like to have a father who cared. And with that, the mystery of the suddenly vanishing Jing spirit is solved. The Chimera Antarch turns the series into new waters in a lot of ways, but among the most consequential is how it completely drops Jing as a motivation. He will, somewhat ironically, appear way more often in person going forward, but the thought of reaching him is no longer what turns the pages. Gon basically forgets he ever existed right alongside the reader, and that's because neither really needs him anymore. Kite comes back to take that space, and he's pretty much way better at it than Jing ever could be. 
And with that, we're back to square one for part two. Moving beyond the literal and physical absence of a father, Gon was equally deprived of his sense of control over life. In fact, the daddy issues are really just the most apparent representation of this core problem. Time for a quick tangent. Before I edited the script, I accidentally wrote being an infant when he was a baby, which is some real people die when they are killed type shit. Just thought you should know. Jing left when Gon was still an infant, meaning he quite literally couldn't do anything to stop it. He was powerless. This being one of his earliest formative experiences is, shall we say, not great. He clearly feels the empty space where his father should be and wants it to be undone, so not being able to affect that system in any way bred deep-seated frustration. I am unhappy, and the cause of that was my lack of power, so if I become powerful, I'll be happy. That logic carries most of the story from that point onward. It's why Gon flips out when he loses to Hisoka, and it's why he's willing to nearly kill himself to not lose to Hanzo. Why he works so hard and does more borderline self-harm in Heaven's Arena to box the clown, and why he'll literally let his arms be blown off in a bid to shut down the bombers. The assumption is that winning those fights will make him happy, as he will prove his control over the universe and be one step closer to reaching his father, the ultimate proof of agency. And Jing, of course, is not fucking helping in the slightest. That message where he tells Gon they'll only meet if he can become a great hunter and find him took the idea of control he already had and reinforced it as a core value. As we already discussed, this value is then what causes him to nearly kill himself over and over and over and over again. Fucking Dazai, motherfucker. Parenting move of the year, as well as one of the most brilliant parts of Hunter x Hunter. The use of a more realistic protagonist reframes the usual steps of the shonen formula as steps towards self-immolation. Togashi gets to explore the limitations and potential of his genre, while also commenting on so many psychological, societal, and philosophical concepts all at once. I, I think I'm starting to understand why people plagiarize you may have noticed I skipped over two arcs in between all those steps, but that doesn't mean they aren't important. I separated them out because York New and Zoldig family show how Gon's trauma affects his relationships with people as opposed to his relationship with strength. Both of these storylines depict one of his friends drifting away from his side, and in both cases he goes apeshit to stop it. Kilua is just a kid he played with for a couple of days, and yet he still throws his entire life to the side just to get him back from his family. And he similarly demands to go goblin mode for Kurapika when he expresses a desire to take on the mission alone, which ends up with numerous opportunities for going to be robbed, kidnapped, or fucking murdered. Part of his reasoning for these drastic actions is a genuine care for his friends, I won't deny that, but the way he treats Kilua later on makes it pretty undeniable that a selfish desire lies at the root. It's much the same as how he cultivates strength not as a noble venture, but out of solipsistic insecurities. Look that word up, fun one. The physical and conceptual are really one, and that entity is who truly has control. Then the Chimera Ant arc arrives and all of a sudden everything's kind of just settled. Gon has control in every aspect at this point of the story. He has a real father figure, loving friends, and the strength to prevail over every antagonist that faces him. It's probably the most fulfilling his life has ever been, and the tone of the series shifts to convey that to the audience. Triumphant, pleasant, full of camaraderie and warm hearts. It shatters in seconds. Control is an illusion. I get that that's cliche and edgy, but it's true. No matter how much money, influence, or physical prowess you have, the chance of being pancaked into the sidewalk by a falling orbital satellite is low, but never zero. This principle is what actually allows the rampage to be perfect. Plenty have said that Gon's reaction to Kite's death is over-exaggerated or that it doesn't make sense, and I'm here to say that they are objectively and categorically wrong. His rampage does spring from that event in part, but it goes way further back. Kite is more of a crossroad than anything else, getting chosen as the unlucky and accidental convergence point for years of unresolved parental trauma and a lifetime of struggling with agency. Gon doesn't lose it because he's sad Kite died. He loses it because that death, in his own mind, confirms everything he subconsciously believed and hated about himself to be true. Everyone will leave me, and I'll never be strong enough to stop them. His vow against Pito follows up about as naturally as two follows one. It's a mad gamble for control. For a fantasy and then can give him that, but the price for bringing the immaterial into existence can inherently be no less than everything he has to give. And Gon has proven time and time again that that is a price he is willing to pay to fill the void in his soul. Possibly the most depressing part of this story is hidden within the mechanics of the limited transformation itself. This is not merely invented strength, but what Gon would have become in time, and even with all that strength, Pito can still take his arm. The path he was on never would have brought him to true happiness, but his parents, his society, and even the conventions of his genre ensured he could never escape.
shit, no, nuh uh. There is absolutely no fucking way I'm making the Chimera Antark into four videos. We're gonna ignore Kilua for now and talk about his development during the chairman election. We gotta get this crazy train moving. If the Gon section sounded like a whole lot of climax to you, uh, congrats on being dumb, that was only the first half. At the same time as the 4chan anti cat girl agenda, the actual plot is occurring somewhere over there. You know, you see it, right? I neglected to discuss Meruem or Komagi in basically any depth in the last episode, which seemed like a fantastic idea at the time. I mean, what, reduce the runtime of the video, keep the entire character analysis in one neat spot? What could possibly go wrong? Guys, I think I fucked up. Whatever, size doesn't matter anyway. If you recall my previous overlong pretentious USB microphone disaster, I said that Hunter x Hunter contained my favorite villain in any story ever. And yeah, it's the Ninja Turtle with the COVID vaccine coming out of his ass. Guys, do not let Meruem inject you with the Chimera vaccine. CNN doesn't want you to know this, but my friend Kite got it, and it turned him trans! The Ant King is an abundantly simple character. He has practically no personality, no motivation, no net abilities, no nothing. Actually, scratch the previous statement, he's barely even a character at all, which is a far cry from most of Hunter x Hunter's cast overall, but especially its villains. All of them, and throw the Yu Yu Hakusho boys in there while we're at it, are fascinating. Sensui, Krolo, Toguro, the Kakin Princes, I could spend days digging into their complexities, and the ones like Hisoka or Periston, who I wouldn't exactly call paragons of depth, are overflowing with personality and intrigue. Every one of Togashi's antagonists is more layered than a 15 second long Death Note dialogue exchange. There is no Genther in Ba Sing Se. That motherfucker back there is not real! Then there's Meruem, who is none of those things, yet I claim him to sit atop the mountain. How is that possible? Well, an important aspect of Meruem is that he is an incomplete character on his own. Just like a puzzle piece, he requires other interlocking pieces to reveal a comprehensible figure. Still, we need to understand him in isolation, which is the environment we view him in for a significant portion of the story, before we can understand his relationships. The King's time in relative solitude establishes what I'd call his pants-shitting aura. The goal of his scenes prior to Kamigi's introduction are to make the audience terrified of him, and it's done pretty effectively. Due to his lack of distinguishing character traits other than violence, Meruem is more comparable to a natural disaster than anything else. Endlessly and indiscriminately destructive for seemingly no reason other than that bloodshed is carved into the very nature of their existence, which is the first driver of his intimidation factor. You can't stop a hurricane. Only pray that it leaves you alive in its wake. But what if Katrina could feel hate? What if an F5 tornado felt joy while it raised your town? What if it never naturally dissipated? What if that thing never got tired? A perfect storm. That's what Meruem truly is, or rather, that's what he is upon his conception. The real terror arises from what he might become. The second reason why Meruem is so effective as a physical threat is because he's an infant. And no, I don't just hate kids. Actually, scratch that, I do fucking hate kids. But that's not what I mean. This idea has been used by many other writers, and since I want to look at some footage that isn't Hunter x Hunter for a while, I'm going to explain it with Jujutsu Kaisen. When we meet Mahito in his own arc, he's basically a toddler. Immature, easily distractible, and completely focused on his own entertainment, entirely unaware of how to actually use the power he was born with. Despite all that, he's already powerful enough to stand up to some of the strongest sorcerers in the series. It becomes impossible to not wonder what he might be capable of given the opportunity to grow, which makes every second of battle against him dire to the maximum. Even if Yuji and Nanami survive this fight, will they be able to exercise him next time? Plus, fighting him at all runs the risk of teaching him something new about himself, like how he was driven to domain expansion by the risk of death. Suddenly, just like that, you're between a rock and a hard place. You can't leave him alone, but you also can't run the risk of making him more powerful through experience. Through this method, Akutami doesn't even have to have Mahito present for you to feel tension over his existence, and his fights all feel like a ticking clock for the protagonists. Meruem does all that in much the same way, except he's already debatably the most powerful being in the series from millisecond one. It's hard to imagine the upper limit of a fully grown king, and his simplicity as a character becomes meaningful through this context. If he can do all this with just his tail, what could he accomplish with an actual Nen ability? Or a gun? All of that is what Meruem is just by himself, which would have made a passable villain on its own, but we've only just begun. To frame my analysis of the king's deeper crevasses, I must first answer another vitally important question, that being, how long am I allowed to talk about Chapter Black? Not much, I decided, mainly for runtime reasons, and also if I talk about Yu Yu Hakusho for that much longer, I'll have to change the title of the video and the thumbnail too, and that's just a lot of fucking work. But its influence is an important aspect of the entire arc's construction, not just Gon's, so a short pit stop is a must. One of Togashi's other crowning achievements, Yu Yu Hakusho's Chapter Black arc explores the sins of humanity and muses over whether or not we even deserve to live. 
a question that is raised in physical form by the chapter black tape itself, which contains recorded evidence of every atrocity ever committed by humans. Should we continue our reign with that much blood behind us? Is the weight of our sins great enough that we should be crushed? Yu Yu Hakusho answers with a resounding no. By the end of that arc, Sensui is defeated, his plan foiled, his cause left behind by his accomplices in exchange for making a positive impact on the world, and most important of all, the tape destroyed by Hiei, leaving both the sins of mankind as well as his own hatred in the past. Confident that the future is converging onto a more positive path. It is an exceedingly hopeful reaffirmation of the idea that humanity's potential for good will always outweigh its potential for evil. We win not through physical power, necessarily, but by being better versions of ourselves. You already knew that, though, and not because you've read the arc. No, you probably knew that from the first chapter of either arc, or of the series, frankly. You weren't spoiled, you haven't absorbed the ending from cultural osmosis. You just feel it in your bones. Ah! I know I did, yet I still couldn't take my eyes off the screen. Considering Chapter Black is widely revered as a classic, I bet the same is true for some of you out there too. But if uncertainty is what creates drama, why do we get invested in stories we already know the ending to? The answer is that we are goddamn egotistical bastards. Almost to a T, human storytelling is centered around defending the value of our existence against an outside threat. Even media that is critical of ourselves usually still reaffirms us. Take Lord of the Rings, for example, where the villains are a very clear metaphor for the ills of industrialization and war. Now, emus notwithstanding, humans are solely responsible for both concepts, yet mankind also prevails in the end. We're egotistical, but we're also too intelligent to completely deny our own evils, so we craft realities where we can overcome our vices through the inherent good in our souls. Chapter Black is just another chapter in that same book. On the surface, humanity is good. Below ground, it's populated with evil. Even further down than that, though, deep within the core is light. Sensui, Seaman, Doctor, Game Master, Sniper, Toguro, all of them were lost souls straight from their rightful path, and all of them were able to find it again with the help of the heroes. There were also those, you know, Sakyo, Elder Toguro, Tarukane, etc., who burned the right path in their wake as they left it, and weren't able to find it again. But you know, we murdered them, so it's chill, whatever. Humanity is cleansed of sin. We love these stories, even if we already know the ending, because we're being told what we want to hear. It's like going to a concert for one of your favorite bands. I already know Muse is going to play Knights of Sidonia at the end, but that doesn't mean it won't still be the highest point of the night. We want to be affirmed, and the author tends to give us what we want. One, for money, you know, it's just good business, but two, and less cynically, because they're human as well, subject to the same predilections as the rest of us. This is where the Chimera Ant arc gets to twist the formula a bit. It is quintessentially a sequel to Chapter Black, telling a functionally identical story. The physical conflict centers around humanity fighting for its survival against the threat of non-human invaders, while the thematic conflict is fought for moral superiority. It's a lot harder to be comfortable placing all your bets on the extermination team, though, than it was on Team Yurameshi, and that's thanks to Marowem. So far, we've only looked at the Ant King as an individual puzzle piece, and with that perspective, this conflict would seem to be incredibly black and white. He's a demon, pure and simple. That's not how any of us remember him, though, and this conflict is certainly not so flat as to be viable for Disney XD. So let's put these jigsaws together to get the full picture. Unlike a lot of his type, you know, Naruto and Sasuke, Ghetto and Gojo, insert your own favorite gaze, who all act as pairs, Meruem requires two foils to serve his purpose. Komagi and Netero. Netero and Meruem are pretty classic narrative foils. Both possess the connecting tissue of being the pinnacles of physical strength among their species while differing in the way they acquired their power. Meruem was born a god, while Netero worked his way to divinity over a long life of effort. A little bit like Rock Lee vs. Gara if you squint at it, and a lot more like it if you open your eyes fully and look like a normal person. The conflict between earned and unearned strength is a bit of a reoccurring theme in shonen fights, which has a lot to do with the genre's relation to human nature. I know, I said I was going to stop being pretentious. Here we go. These stories are primarily defined by violence, and thus characters must be defined by their ability to inflict violence. This is not any matter of distorted reality, rather a near-perfect mirror, reflecting humanity's genetic instincts back at us. We arrived where we are now through a long series of evolution and natural selection where the man most adept at Twilight-esque deer-catching is often given the greatest reward. The tendency to admire the most successful among us comes straight from that history, and since our brains are still somehow lagging behind into the years when we were cavemen, we tend to value physical strength. Skip to the natural conclusion, and we start asking if Genghis Khan could beat Goku. We don't tend to see bears as above us, though. For proof, just ask any man of a list of animals he thinks he could beat in a fight. And that's because the desire to venerate power runs directly against the desire to venerate society, which we've created. From this contradiction, the action hero is born. 
I think we really love shonen and action adventure stories at large because the main characters who lead them use their power, which appeals to the parts of our brain unaffected by 6,000 years of civilization, in service of preserving the best of our qualities which came later. The villains, often holding near equal strength, can then still appeal to our smooth brain side without much risk the audience will prefer them to the hero since they stand in opposition to the qualities we value. In a way, the entire genre is a reaffirmation of the value of violence. If battle is an inherent part of our nature, then we need violence in the service of other values to stand up to it. Applying that logic to our current predicament, a surface-level examination should cement the expected answer even further. Netero is defending the organizations, systems, and people the story has focused on and glorified up to this point against Meruem's indiscriminate killings. A dumped out bucket of razor blades versus a finely polished rapier. Now, before you start yelling at me, I'm not making that argument. This is only true if you ignore the entirety of Meruem's development in the second act, which comes by way of his other foil. Komagi really shouldn't mean anything to the king whatsoever. His ideology that violence is the only force of significance in the universe is so diametrically opposed to her vulnerability that she might as well be the woman to his League of Legends player. Murdering her would probably take less effort than it would to keep her alive. Putting that in his language of natural selection, she has no right to survive. Bars! The only reason the relationship extends beyond victim and victimizer is because of another Togashi pearl of wisdom. Control and power are a type of boredom far beyond misery. Don't believe me? Well, why are so many rich people depressed, and why does Meruem spend most of the second act farming wheat and settlers of Catan? It's because meeting challenges and finding ways to overcome them is what makes life interesting. A world with no friction is a world of pure tedium. So although Togashi frames it as purely a time killer, Meruem's board game habit is most likely a subconscious search for challenge. Why else would he allow this guy time to recover from his illness and then a rematch afterward? No one can entertain him in a fight, but maybe the country's greatest players can in their respective specialties. For as long as that doesn't work, he fails to find much interest beyond seeing the hands of the clock spin, but an obsession develops the second Komagi steps onto the stage. She is the only person who can beat him, although not in a battle of fists. Every other player Meruem beat strengthened his belief that proficiency in violence ruled all things, but his ability to win against someone so completely incapable of physical dominance shatters that perception. There must be forces in the world with value other than power, and realizing this forces him to abandon his worldview and reconsider the role of king. What is the point of his mindless pursuit of physical dominance? Now, this doesn't mean that the pursuit of supremacy is always corrupting, of course. Komagi is equally dedicated to being the best in her field as Meruem, but her skill is Gungi. Gungi? Funky chess. It's a game, one that requires nowhere near the same level of sacrifice as his. She can still have a personality, friends, and a family, but Meruem's society demands nothing more from him than to kill and be the best at killing. Those ties could only ever hinder that mission, which is why he stays away from them, and also why we dehumanize both our enemies and ourselves in war, to at least some extent. The presence of connections creates empathy and forces you to imagine your prey having similar connections. How are you supposed to slaughter them with maximum efficiency if they're just like you? But if his mission is greater than Kamigi's, or even if they were equal, why does she de why does she why does she derive joy from hers, while he gains increasingly little pleasure from his own? Why is violence, the most important force in the world, becoming a simple, repetitive obligation no more engaging than your average 9 to 5? The interaction with this person, so opposite to himself yet so similar at the same time, is what allows Meruem to break away from valuing only what aligns best with our evolutionary history. Other qualities may be just as powerful. Now let's take a look at Netero. As the head of the series' main governmental body, or at least the one that seems to be most globally important, he should perfectly represent the human qualities and values being highlighted by the series. That's the entire purpose of the powerful old man archetype, if you think about it. They created the current order that is then reaffirmed by their nobility before being left in the hands of the youth to carry it forward. With that, you'd expect Netero to be a bit of a Paragon-esque figure. Let's see how that turned out. Well, after being almost entirely absent from the last 200-something chapters or 90-ish episodes, the chairman is back, and he has... drone-bombed a blind teenage girl. Sir, the United States government is on the line. They'd like to make a deal. So yeah, just like Meruem, there's more to Netero than what you can get from a silhouette test. If Shueisha had run an approval rating poll for the Hunter Association and its chairman periodically throughout the series' run, I'd be willing to bet the house on it that it looks something like this. <sighs> like a college student in this market has a house to bet. I'd bet all $47.29 in my bank account. The audience is trained over a long period of time to view the association and its leader as righteous figures. Both remain largely irrelevant to the central storyline, and whenever they are around, we get only the most surface-level view of their best traits. 
Permeating in this void of concrete information, the only source we as an audience have to base our perceptions on are the series' perspective characters, basically all of whom happen to be hunters. Strange coincidence, huh? Not even mentioning the fact that most of our main characters are very enthusiastic about joining the system. Togashi shades the way the reader sees his world in an almost cult-like manner, withholding just the right amount of information to prevent you from asking questions, which is really good for the Hunter Association. Because if you stop to think about it for longer than like a couple of seconds, it becomes clear as day that this shit is Professor Toad pitching in Mario Super Sluggers for the Wii levels of Broken. Congrats to me for writing a reference that like, two people will get. As I see it, a proper organization or government needs to have two qualities in the right proportion. Authority and accountability. The exact ratio desired will depend on your political philosophy, of course, but I at least believe a balance is necessary. A government with total authority and no accountability is tyrannical. No barriers exist to prevent them from stomping all over the citizenry. On the other end of the spectrum, a government with total accountability and no authority would be completely ineffective. How are they supposed to help if they can't do anything? Maybe you'd like that if you're an anarchist and uh, sure, go off king, I'm not here to argue what for or against that position. Oops, my anarchy symbol. I'm just here to point out that the Hunter Association's position on this scale is just a little bit fucky-wucky, for lack of a better term. If you were to qualify the Boy Scouts of America Armed Forces Division as a governmental body, which I absolutely do, I mean, every hunter is given total international amnesty, funding which I can only assume comes from taxes, and they're called in by world governments to solve political issues kind of like how the UN would if they had any problem-solving capabilities whatsoever. That right there is a fantastic example of no authority, all accountability. Anyway, for a political organization, the Hunter Association has overwhelming authority by way of its military might. Despite the number of hunters being rather low, there are individual members like Netero and Illumi who could probably solo an entire army, and even the lowliest of Pockles are magnitude stronger than the average soldier. I'm so sorry that I'm slandering you, baby. Nen is also a mysterious realm that most of the population can't even see, much less fight back against. Could a fully united association beat Goku? I don't know. Consult with an even dorkier channel for that. But they're definitely no diffing the US or China. With that level of power, they should be getting checks and balances in the mail like I get messages from Team Snapchat on Valentine's Day. But you know who can get a hunter's license? The known murderer and groomer who gets erections while looking at children on live television who also dresses like a clown. I think the last point alone should be more than enough to disqualify Hisoka, but no, no, let's use our tax dollars to fund him and his ideas. He really, he really seems like he wants to help people. There are no rejections from the association on a moral basis, unless you literally kill someone during the exam. In which case, they don't even arrest you. They're just like, guys, no killing other contestants in general. This has been a consistent issue. You're in your flop era, honey. Uh, bye, bitch. So terrible people are given access to ridiculous amounts of money and the planet, and the power structure they exist under does almost nothing to keep them in line. Sure, the rules restrict heinous crimes, but that's a little bit a lot fucking vague. This isn't a heinous crime? And if it wasn't already clear that this organization is in place for the benefit of its members and no one else, literally the only restriction against killing in the rules is that hunters may not kill other hunters unless they happen to be a heinous culprit. Also, there's literally nothing in place to stop Hisoka from getting elected chairman and turning this joint into a second man-boy love association. Even if he'll never be popular enough to get the votes, neither were Bush and Trump. The fact that it's possible at all should probably worry somebody. These traits are bewildering for a political organization, but they make a whole lot of sense under the context of what this organization actually is. A vanity project for one old man who refuses to release his grip on a world now far younger than he is. Sir Isaac Netero has been ruling over this organization for a long time, and all of its rules are specifically crafted to support his selfish pursuit of ultimate power. Members are licensed based on strength due to his hope that they might someday be strong enough to entertain him. His council, people who have a lot of international power, were chosen purely because they can do fisticuffs with the old man without immediately dying. Jing shouldn't be allowed to manage a pet rock, much less a goldfish, much less a child, much less international politics. Yet here we are! He picked Periston as his vice chairman because he thought he would be the most difficult to work with, therefore the most fun. That'd be like if Bernie and Trump decided to share the presidency. If this guy hit me with a good morning, I'd probably cry, that's how obviously evil he is. Similar to what is often the case in real life, the older generation has used their power to shape the world into an image that benefits themselves, making Netero an inversion of his archetype. Like I said, your average third Hokage or Yamamoto figure is meant to instill reverence for your elders and the status quo but Hunter x Hunter is more intent on highlighting the hypocrisy that tends to come from them. If your world is so great, why is it only for you? It's not like Togashi is exactly subtle, either. I mean, for his net ability, Netero summons a Bodhisattva, who are all about compassion and working for the benefit of every living being, and then he uses it to just go to town on motherfuckers. Only a little bit of a tip-off, if you ask me. 
So even though Netero is clearly fighting for the survival of humanity, it's not clear how much of his reasoning lies in the fact that the loss of humanity would correspond with the collapse of the systems he created and exploits. He is the twisting of admirable human traits. Meanwhile, Meruem is on the path to an actual appreciation of compassion and empathy. Sure, he isn't exactly there yet, but he lacks the pure avaricious stranglehold on reality possessed by the old guard of the current world, creating an inversion of the expectations set by Chapter Black and practically every other shonen story. The villain is the one truly worthy to possess the future, not the hero. Even the very structure of this series is crafted to support this conclusion. We get a wealth of scenes observing Meruem, our villain, watching him develop and change, while Netero, our hero, quotation marks, is a complete stranger. The signs have been there all along, and it's for these reasons that Meruem wins this fight. Oh, uh, wait, wait a minute, what? Is that, is that right? Okay, uh, sorry for the delay, folks. It, it'll be just a minute. We'll be right back. Okay, we just sent the footage to New York, and New York has confirmed that Netero has won the fight. You know. Guys, guys, I'm sorry. No, there's a, there's a mistake. Netero, you guys won the fight. That doesn't make any sense. How on earth has this happened? Well, it's actually incredibly simple. Meruem may have been on an upward path to understanding and peace, opposite to Netero's lifelong headspin into violent depravity, but he wasn't human. We knew how the story ended from the very beginning. Humanity wins. Of course humanity wins. We always do, in real life and in fiction. These stories aren't merely lip service to our egos. They're the truth. We're the victors. But not because of any inherent moral superiority. No. We prevail because more than any other species in existence, we have a bottomless well of malice. We will do anything, no matter how disgusting, depraved, fucked up, or evil, to ensure our own survival. Netero chooses basically the cruelest possible backup plan with no consideration for the effect it would have on anyone else, and it doesn't even save his own life. But it gives him the win. That's what's important to him. And that's what's important to the people who rule us. And their victory will always rule over our morality. Consider the fact that, between Meruem and Netero, the Ant King is far and away the superior fighter. He has the durability to survive the Bodhisattva's fists for an extended time while he works out their pattern, and not even a zero hand can finish him off. Even factoring in the poor man's rose, which is powerful enough to kill him, I'd still say Meruem has the potential to make the man cry for a life alert like 8 times out of 10. The only reason the bomb was ever dropped in the first place is because he took Netero's limbs instead of his head, all for the hope of knowing the identity his mother lovingly bestowed upon him. A piece of self so vital and personal that the chairman, of course, couldn't help but find a way to weaponize it. Meruem loses because of his growing appreciation for values outside the base evolutionary drive. Values which powerful men like Netero love to virtue signal about and then lock away as soon as they become a hindrance. This is humanity. We are no better than the ants. In fact, we are far worse. Remember when I said I was going to stop being so pretentious? Ugh, me too. Alright, let's lighten the mood a little bit. The messaging of this story isn't entirely so bleak, and to prove it, I return to the idea that Hunter x Hunter is a deconstruction of the shonen genre, hopefully for the final time. One of the biggest action-adventure conventions is the final battle. Stories end with the point of highest intensity, it's just common sense. The average person has seen this formula play out so many times, including in pretty much every shonen ever made, that they instinctively assume they'll get an epic conclusion. The Chimera Ant arc does have one of these, and it's one of the finest ever made, but Togashi really blows his load early. The headlining match happens barely over halfway through the third act, leaving a ton of space to fill after the rose. This is true even if you subtract the time spent on Discord Mod versus Discord Kitten, which isn't even much of a battle. The choice to fill that space by bringing Meruem back to life, with a ticking clock on said life for urgency at that, implies a final clash even greater than what came before. The audience has denied this. Meruem abandons the glorious final blaze demanded by his genre in exchange for one more night with the person he cares most about in the world, and the series follows him in its trajectory. Togashi is done fighting, he's done battling, and he's done warring, at least for the rest of the volume. We've had enough. It's time to find a better way. But what does this mean? Well, if you remember three paragraphs ago, I said that Meruem wasn't human, but that's not entirely true. He's at least part human, I mean, all of the ants are, and our gene pool is where they pull many of their most important traits from. Yes, it's where they gain the potential for cruelty beyond the circle of life, 
but also for love, empathy, regret, and individualism. All of these traits that make the world a more fair and forgiving place which only arise from the unique blend of reason and hubris that comprise humanity are shown off, in the ants and also in the human characters. Some start off with strong principles and some gain them along the way, but it's impossible to deny that the show presents a worldview where humans are capable of learning and of change, of seeing the sins of our predecessors and altering our ways to avoid them, creating a better future. And that... <sighs> brings us straight back to Chapter Black. What the fuck, bro? Oh, what the hell? What was the point of this entire arc or of this entire video? Ugh. I spent like four goddamn months making this. Do you know how many parties I could have gone to instead of spending my nights editing? None. I don't get invited to parties. And since no one knows sunk cost fallacy like a nine-year Destiny player, I'm gonna try to salvage this. I don't actually have to try very hard, though, because Togashi is presenting new ideas, just more subtly than it first appears. Chapter Black implies the existence of a perfect state for humanity somewhere in the future, one free of our prejudice and violence that comes about by the way of good people with power making it so. An incomprehensible idea from the perspective of Hunter x Hunter. Because there will always be another Netero. Maybe even beyond Netero. Power gives way to corruption and injustice, and humanity gains it from the structures it has built. Those structures are then what have allowed us to survive so long past what would have been our natural expiration date so why would we ever disassemble them, even if they come at the detriment of everything else? We'll never get rid of the cruelty we've created, but that doesn't mean we can't still choose to be good people within that cruelty. Meruem and the series itself only achieved their highest and most peaceful point in the aftermath of their greatest violence. Our peace may rest on the foundation of blood spilled by the most evil among us, but we still have an obligation to accept it and move forward. For the world and for ourselves. That's the core of the Chimera Antarch's beauty, and why I find it more inspiring than Chapter Black ever could be. It's an undistorted reflection of reality, and within it we can find a way to still live good lives. Who knows? Maybe if enough of us follow suit, someday the world can evolve until Chapter Black is its true reflection. Or maybe not. The point doesn't change. And that's that! I am pretty much out of things to say about the Chimera Antark. Wow, really? You're only now out of things to say? This video was a mess both in the final product and in its production. At least I think so, I mean, who knows, maybe all the words I vomited onto the script will make perfect sense to you guys, but I'm under no illusion that this is a cohesive or sensical work. That feels appropriate to me though. I don't think I could analyze Hunter x Hunter here in any way that isn't just as scattered and kintsugi together as the actual work itself, which is definitely a hot-ass mess, but it's a hot-ass mess that Togashi should be proud of. I'm proud of this video too, even if it isn't all I imagined it being. And because of that, I feel like going just a bit above and beyond. The real video is officially done, so feel free to log off, but I'm gonna run through some bonus features now, starting with individual score rankings for each act of the arc. The first act is solid as a rock. Well paced, well plotted, great character work, and great action. I really have basically nothing to complain about here. Eight out of 10. The second act is kind of a stinky poo poo, but it's not really that bad. If there was ever anything in the universe that qualified as mid, this would be it. And so it takes a big fat five. Finally, I've got my problems with the third act, but they're so overwhelmingly dwarfed by whatever the hell I spent the last hour of your life and the last 2,000 of mine rambling about that I have no choice but to descend from the heavens and place a thick, juicy 9 out of 10 on it. As for an overall score, I could average the individual numbers out and leave you with a 7.3 repeating onto infinity, but the second and third acts are so much longer that they kind of have to be given more weight. So here's a big ol' 7 out of 10. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, and both of those have already passed by the time I made this video. It's not even close. Uh, Happy Valentine's Day? God fucking damn it. By the way, here are some bits I set up in other videos that I couldn't really find a good place for in this one. Soldier boy. Now, Gon doesn't actually kill a child in this scene, but he really wants to. So I'm gonna move him to the middle of the Venn diagram. You're gonna be dead, lobster. Okay, and now for the final, final, final. Announcement time. This video took way longer to make than I expected, which I do apologize for. I've kind of been gone for a while, haven't I? God. Either way, life got busy and there wasn't much I could do about that. Bad idea starting a video this large right in the middle of final season. That was a good idea. McFly. But to make up for it, I got a whole lot of fun projects in the works right now that you should be seeing in the near future. Stay tuned for those, although, full warning, the election arc video is not currently among them. I do have a script for it that's well on its way to being completed, but I need a little break from Hunter x Hunter, I hope you can understand why. Not too long of a break though, probably around three or four videos, but a break nonetheless. My voice is kinda, kinda bailing on me here. 
It is coming though, because I vowed to do the entire series and I won't be able to die satisfied until I do. Anyway, to wrap things up, if you've stuck with me for every entry of this series so far, or if you're here after that last video, or if this is the first time you've ever seen one of my videos, or if you clicked on this video and stopped watching two minutes in and therefore are not seeing this message at all, thank you. Truly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. It's incredible to me that anybody watches these at all, and although I do make videos primarily because I enjoy it, it's undoubtedly super fun to know some people are getting something out of my work. And I hope you can continue to get something out of them, whether that be entertainment or rage, into the future. Like, subscribe, share the video, and all that other stuff if you enjoyed it. Comment below if you want to provide criticism, alternative interpretations, shit posts, or if you just want to chat. And hopefully, I'll see you again soon. Until next time. I fucked up!